It was weird because we, it was like, oh, there you are. It was pretty much instant. And you're getting me to cry. Yeah. Sorry. He was super smart, and that is so attractive to me. Incredibly laid back, very easy. To my outgoing and fast moving, and he was like, you know, we would joke, you know, I'd say on a Saturday, what are we doing? And he's like, do, what's this do you speak of? Can't we just be? This was a guy who was great, doing great, um, healthy, loving our little beach house, and he had a happy last six months of his life. There's a big oyster fest at um, the, the house on the Eastern Shore, and we had friends there that weekend, and it was kind of dark and gloomy outside. I'm like, well, I'll go get breakfast, and then, you know, we were just gonna watch movies and just hang out, because we had a big weekend, and came back, and he said, you know, don't get alarmed, but I called an ambulance. I'm like, for what? And he's like, I'm having trouble breathing. I went to the hospital where I was told, and he wasn't there. And they said, oh, well, maybe he's behind you. And I said, no, they left, you know, 10 minutes in front of me. Well, apparently he went into cardiac arrest and they diverted him to another hospital. Um, they tried to intubate him and it went into his esophagus instead of his lungs. And he was in a coma for four weeks. You have a series of physicians that come through. You know, he had a neurologist, he had a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, and then several hospitalists over the over time um, who all had, you know, focused on various parts of his body. And, you know, great, his, his heart looks great, good, his lungs look good. He's still on a, you know, he's still in a coma. I was asking those pointed questions. Can you tell me, how long was he out without oxygen in the ambulance? 15 minutes. If we had heard that day one, we would have known the direction this was taking. The pulmonologist was one of my heroes at the end of the day because he came in and I, I said, stop, <laughs> you know, we keep looking at his parts. Can you look, you know, you're looking at his lungs. They look great, don't they? And then he sits down and he takes off his gloves and he's like, let me talk to you a little bit about, he's like, I can't tell you what to do, but let me tell you what I think is going on right now. And he talked about the base of the brain being the stem of the tree, the, the branches being, you know, kind of your everyday living activities, being walking and talking and moving, and then the tips of the trees, the leaves being who Dave is. And I said, where do you, what, what a part of the tree is Dave right now? And he's like, I think he's the trunk. So um, that was the first real honest conversation I had. You have no idea until you've gone through it. Now that it's my husband, really my partner, and then when you meet people who have gone through it, there's almost like a kindred spirit. The paramedic who was working on him, you know, when at the house, you can't blame him. Um, accidents happen, you're in a moving vehicle. Intubation, you know, what I've since learned, it's extremely difficult to do in, in a setting that's not a moving vehicle. There was nobody I felt like who was in charge of coordinating all of this care. Had I'd heard or someone said, you know, 15 minutes without oxygen or anoxic brain injury, I would have never had him trached or put a feeding tube into him two weeks into the process. I would have been able to better make those decisions that we needed to make. I mean, it wasn't about me. This was not how he'd want to be.